This is actually our one guest speaker from outside of uh, the Syracuse kind of family, so to speak. And we thought it would be interesting to talk about outbreak analytics. And so, and people, maybe you can give a short introduction to yourself. That's how we've done with the other speakers, so, um, so I don't mess it up. And then jump into the talk. So can we switch over to, yeah, thank you. Yes, sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. Uh, can you hear this? The sound cut out a little bit, so I don't know if you can hear me now. Yes, okay, brilliant, okay. Yes, yes. yeah, we can. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Thibaut Jomba. I'm an associate professor in Outbreak Analytics. I'm going to tell you about what Outbreak Analytics is um, in a minute. I work in London uh, for two universities, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Imperial College. Um, and I've been in this field roughly for the last 10 years. Uh, and I think right now I am going to share screen and start sharing my slides. Um, word on the slides, I will be sharing the URL of my slides after uh, the talk. I'll have to dash after the talk. I apologize for I won't be able to stay to stick, stick around for the rest of the event. Um, but feel free to treat my slides as uh, you know, Creative Common Attribution CC BY as if, if you want to reuse them, please uh, go for it. Okay. Uh, can somebody just confirm that you are seeing my slides full screen now? Yes, no. Okay, I'll I'll just assume that you'll jump in if you if you cannot see, yeah, my, see we, my slides. We can hear it. Anyone. Okay, and see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, I apologize. I keep having notices of um, people in the waiting room. I'll close them for now. Okay, so I'll be telling you a little bit about outbreak analytics uh, in the next twenty minutes or so, and then I, I guess we'll have plenty of time for a conversation after this. Um, so I've got actually a short course of five days on outbreak analytics. So I tried to condense quite a lot of things in, in just a, a short 20 minutes. So that there'll be gaps. Uh, what I'll try and, and do is give you a few examples of outbreak analytics applications. And, and to start with, we'll actually talk about what outbreak analytics is. So this slide usually is uh, more um, telling to the people in the UK because these are faces that um, pretty much the general public in the, in the United Kingdom will have seen over the last year and a half now. Um, and uh, I don't know to, to what extent it, it's been similar in the US, but in the UK, there's been a lot of focus on infectious disease modeling in relation with the COVID-19 response. And so basically for me, that was the first time uh, in, 10 years doing this job that I was seeing my colleagues and my line managers, which you, whom you see here uh, in, in the newspaper, on TV, uh, on the like major media outlets um, to discuss sometimes quite advanced uh, modeling concepts like over dispersion in reproduction number, which some of the articles that I'm putting down there um, are actually um, talking about. So it's really come to the, to the front of the scene, so to speak. Infectious is modeling uh, over the last, well, year and a half really with the COVID crisis, uh, but it was there before. And um, it, it's becoming trendy now to look at trends, but it was actually a thing before that. Um, and in fact, there's a little bit of a distinction between infectious disease modeling, which is the application of mathematical modeling to the analysis of outbreaks, really. So how fast is it growing? How can we contain it? Basically, the kind of question you, you, can, uh, you can address through these kind of tools. Um, and in fact, you could, you could take a broader view uh, to the whole thing, um, thinking that it's not just about the modeling. It's about all the steps of data analysis that you will need to take to be able to go from data that's observed on the ground in the field and informing decision making. And uh, so I've been involved personally with, uh, with several infectious disease outbreaks before, um, before COVID-19, which some of which I will talk about, but especially uh, an outbreak of uh, Ebola in, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'll touch on to that very soon. Um, and the idea was really, we need to be on the ground and we need to be able to use all the toolkit of modern data science to inform the response in real time as well as possible. So 
to describe the emergence of this field, because that was kind of a new field in data science dedicated to the analysis of outbreaks. We, we coined that term outbreak analytics, and there's this paper that we, that we wrote uh, in 2019 um, to describe the emergence of this new field, which basically is at the crossroad of many different fields, which is including field epidemiology, methodological research, research in stats and um, uh, machine learning, if you want, uh, but also software development and, and public health um, public health response, really. And the aim of this, of this, say, new data science really is to inform the response to emergencies in real time. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, a little bit of compliment on the context. Um, I, it had been a, a few years I was interested in, in developing tools for outbreak analytics and um, there was a real gap there, there still is, it's, it's being filled. I'll come back to this, I think, on my very last slide. Uh, but to cut a long story short, I put together originally a network that then turned into a non-governmental organization called RECON, the R Epidemics Consortium. And it's basically a, an initiative to develop R packages, R as in the, the language for data analysis. Um, so basically to develop free packages for data science geared towards the analysis of outbreaks. And um, okay, so that's a little bit of context. It's a very recent data science. Um, there are still quite a few gaps in, uh, in the tools that we need. There are still a lot of things that we're not quite sure how to do, but there are some things that we can use data science for when it comes to informing the response to epidemics. Now, for most of us, this is a, a very a different context to the one we usually see in data science. So. The outbreak I'm going to be talking about quite a lot in this talk is uh, an outbreak of the Ebola virus disease in the Eastern DR DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, from 2018 to uh, the official end was 2020. Some of you might have heard of this one uh, in the media, the larger outbreak a few years before that in West Africa uh, was probably a, a little bit more known to the general public. Uh, but this one was still the, the second largest epidemic in the world and the largest in DRC. And it was a very, um, very difficult epidemic because uh, of the context. So for those of you who don't know about Ebola, uh, think of, of a nightmare of an infectious disease. It's, um, it's basically caused by a virus um, that we believe is in the animal reservoir, in bats probably circulating there. Uh, but when it transmits to humans, it is extremely deadly. It's an absolutely terrible disease. We are looking at roughly 60 to 70 percent of the people who get the disease who die from the disease, which is, you know, amongst the death deadliest diseases that known to mankind currently. And uh, this outbreak was roughly three and a half thousand cases, which for an Ebola outbreak is, is very substantial. Now, what made, so there's no easy Ebola outbreak, but what made this outbreak even harder to handle was the place where it was happening. It was happening in North Kivu and Italy. These are two provinces uh, on the Eastern part of the RC, which, for probably the last 50 to 60 years have been under very frequent military conflict and armed conflict. There's a lot of uh, different uh, paramilitary groups there. Um, I think uh, ISIS basically made their uh, position there in, in Beni, in the city where I was at the time, uh, known the month I, I arrived there. Uh, and, and there's tons of others and it's very, very dangerous place. There's a lot of violence, a lot of poverty. Um, and that makes responding to any emergency uh, very difficult. It's threats to the local population, of course, first and foremost, but also to the response staff and, and facilities. So kind of a different context, but uh, sorry, one of the things I should highlight, and I'm gonna try and get a laser pointer, a virtual laser pointer here. Uh, one of the things I should highlight is that, that that was also probably the first time, at least to my knowledge, that there was a data science cell dedicated to informing the response in real time. There was an analytical cell um, created as part of this response pretty much from the get going. And personally, I've been spending about a year there, well, six months in total, but like across three different missions in the year. And my job there was really to build uh, the data infrastructure for this, uh, this cell. So what can you do with data science to inform operations? Well, there's a, there's a few things. Um, the first thing is sometimes just a, a, a nice telling visualization. 
I don't know if that visualization is nice, like you'll make that call, but at least it was useful. So what you see on this graph in um, on the x-axis, of course, is time. And on the y-axis, you see numbers of people that are sick with Ebola on a given day. Now, when, you, when people report cases, and you've seen that with COVID, what you report typically is either the number of new cases, that's your daily or weekly incidence, or the total number of people that have been infected so far. But very rarely do you have an indication of how many of the prevalence, that is how many people are sick currently today. Now, this was presented at um, a meeting, a weekly meeting we're having with all the decision makers of all the big UN agencies. So the World Health Organization, um, the, the military branch of the UN, the, the World Food Program, everyone was there and, and several NGOs as well. Everyone knew the outbreak very well. And I asked how many people are sick today with Ebola and nobody had a clue how many these were. Now, what you see on this graph is like there's two shades that the, the total that you see on the y-axis is the number of people sick on a given day. But the important thing is the distinction between the, the darker shade, which is cases we know about, and the lighter shade, which is cases we don't know about. So we don't know about yet, but we will know about them eventually. The reason why we don't know about them yet is they've basically not been detected yet. They are sick in their communities, probably uh, passing on the um, more infections. And the important message of this graph here is that basically if you look at on a given day, uh, the chances you get to control your outbreak is basically determined by how much of the dark shade you have. If everything's dark, everything's known, that means there is very little ongoing transmission. And the opposite is true if like as this case, on a given day, half of the cases are not detected yet then that means you've got a problem because all of these lighter shades are still passing on the disease. Now, there was a question in relation to that. It's like, why do we have that? Well, we have that because there is a delay to case detection. And um, the question is like, how does this impact if we reduce the delay to detection or to hospitalization of cases? Um, how is this going to impact transmission? Now, based on some, some data that we had on who infected whom and when people Oh, sorry, I'm hearing myself a lot. Um, I don't know if it's possible to tweak the sound, but I'm hearing myself with an, a lot of echo. That's a bit disturbing. Sorry, I'll keep talking, but if you can fix it, that'd be great. Um, okay, so basically what you see here on this graph is the distribution of how long it takes when a people is sick with, sick with Ebola for them to infect new people. So how, how many days after they get their own set of symptoms, after they start being ill, uh, how many days does it take for them to infect new people? And so that's a probability distribution. So basically what this says is like, mostly it's between zero and, and 20 days, very little transmission happens 20 days after the onset of symptoms. Now, the interesting thing in this case is that we positioned the mean reporting delay, that is the average time it took us to detect an hospitalized patient. Uh, and it was about seven days. And so that's like right on this part of the distribution here. Now, why does it matter? Well, it matters because that means that on average, if this vertical line here marks where we essentially interrupt transmission, because when people get hospitalized, ideally they stop spreading the infection, right? Unless you have transmission within your hospital, which we had as well, but that's a different story. Uh, but basically everything which is right from this line, ideally is avoided transmission. And so the question was, What's happening? What's going to happen if we can shorten that delay? Well, if we can actually switch it to say three and a half days, basically we can calculate, we can give an estimate of how much we will reduce transmission. And in this case, so that would be like this case, for instance, if we shift by just three and a half days, so we have the average reporting delay, on average, we estimated that we would avert 30% of the secondary transmission. And in this case, that 30% was taking us from a R, a reproduction number that is the average number of secondary case, of new cases per infected person below one, which is the threshold. I'm sure you've heard of that over the media outlets. But basically that 30% reduction meant control of the outbreak, which was a, a very big operational impact because that meant a chance to control was not deploying more people, not having a heavier footprint on the communities, but 
being able to access the cases faster. And for that, we needed community engagement. So that this was an example of, of simple analysis that basically were used to inform the, the response like directly. Um, so still talking about this outbreak, uh, another case, but this uh, of data science being applied to inform the outbreak this time um, with a little bit more modeling involved. I said this was a violent place. Uh, we had, we faced several attacks, armed attacks uh, on several Ebola treatment centers in the course of the outbreak. Um, these were, you know, absolutely terrible. We lost some, some patients. Uh, we, we actually lost some people, some staff as well, uh, that got killed during these, these attacks. So you, you see here um, a photo that was taken just a day after the attack. Uh, and basically a whole Ebola treatment center was burned to the ground. And uh, so it, it has, when this kind of thing happens, of course, it's going to have a very strong impact on, on dynamics of the disease. Cases are going to go up because surveillance is going to crash for a few days. We won't be able to treat patients uh, or to welcome new patients and treat them. So that's, that's quite terrible. Um, I've written a paper on, on some of the consequences and of, of this kind of event on Ebola dynamics but um, that, that I link here. But um, the question at the time was, we are going to rebuild in a few weeks time because uh, that's how long it's going to take us. How big does it does the new center need to be? So the question, I'm, I'm gonna cut a long story short here. I'm very happy to take more technical questions after, but basically we had data on um, how long people were staying at hospital. And you see some curves here and how long people stay at hospital with Ebola depends on whether they survive or whether they are going to die. Um, so it's a composite distribution here, but basically we, we can integrate all of these and get this like a, a distribution for um, the duration of stay in a hospital, which we can use for sim computer simulations. So what we're gonna do is we're going to estimate how fast the transmission spreads. We're going to estimate how many cases we expect to see in the next few days and then for every case we'll simulate a course of hospitalization and then we just count um, how many beds are taken on a given day in our simulations and of course this is a random process so we won't take just one or two simulations we'll take a few hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands um, actually i'm exaggerating it was only five thousand but doesn't really matter in this case. And so what you see here is, is what I presented at the time, and you can tell because this actually is in French, DRC is a French speaking country. Um, what you see here on this graph are two things. The, the pink bars are numbers of cases, the real ones and the simulated ones. Um, and what you see with the box plots here are um, predictions across all the 5,000 simulations of, of how many hospital beds are needed on a given day. So all of these box plots are simulations and the red dot here is the data point of the day I was presenting the analysis, which reassuringly was right in the middle of the predictions. And so what this was suggesting was that actually in terms of bed capacity by the end of October would be below 20 beds and they were aiming for a little bit more than 20. So uh, the take home message of this analysis was um, if everything stays as things are currently are, we are expecting the, the new facility to be enough to accommodate the new patient, which it was quite thankfully at the time. And this kind of thing, of course, is, is a general problem. And in fact, we've reused exactly the same thing now for, for the UK. I mean, I'm, I say now, but it's been, uh, it's been around for a year now, but we've turned that into a, a shiny app. So it's a, a web app, which is um, basically using R in the background um, to forecast bed needs for COVID-19 this time in the UK. Uh, I'm part of the, the modeling committee informing the government in the UK for COVID-19. So this was one of the tools that was uh, actually at the time used to show that we were going uh, like, uh, a and &E services were going to get saturated and we needed to, to go on lockdown soon. So uh, another example of uh, that kind of modeling in impacting decision-making. And I'm very aware that I'm dragging along. I've got three minutes, so um, I'll probably go very quickly over this. Uh, it's very trendy to talk about machine learning uh, for good reasons. One of the problems that we had with COVID in the UK and other places was to actually detect whether or not there were recent changes in some locations. 
So you, you can you know break down your space in many, many different locations and you want to be able to pick up the new flare-ups of infection. And so that's kind of the, of the problem here. You've got case numbers of cases of the time. The question is, are that compatible with what we've seen so far or is, is there a marked acceleration there? And I'll cut a long, very long story short here, but basically, there were methods to, to address this kind of problem that we were not completely satisfied with at, at the time. Um, and it became very problematic, especially when working with the World Health Organization who wanted to be able to do surveillance at a worldwide level with countries that had very different temporal trends. And I illustrate here the differences between all of these different, you know, from near exponential trends or linear with some noise or different types of periodicity, changes, changes in trends, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what we did was to develop a, a new method. And I'm sorry, because I'm going to have to go quickly over this. So I won't give you the technical detail of it. Uh, what we did was use an automated machine learning approach to address this problem. And what the method really does is it's going to look at the past trend, fit many, many different models, hundreds of models to the past trend, get the best model, the best fitting model, say, okay, well, this is the this is the dynamics that we've observed over the last say five or six weeks. And then it's going to compare these dynamics to the last few days of data. And if the last few days of data are very far from the model, then we'll basically raise a red flag and say, look, it looks like it's accelerating. Cases are higher up than we expect to see given the past trends. And basically, so this is a, a, an R package called Trend Breaker, which is not released yet, but you can already see it. It's on GitHub. And you, you can see here being, it, it being used for surveillance on country levels. Uh, and what you see, up like, so for Albania, for instance, this is the raw data and this is the output of the Trend Breaker package, where every time there's a, a data point, that should raise a red, perhaps a red flag, it will be flagged in red here. And you can see, for instance, in the case of Turkey here, even though the data points didn't seem just at the naked eye to, to mark a very strong acceleration, they actually were. And it was confirmed after that, actually, Turkey was a little bit out of control after this. Um, and so this is, I've worked with the WHO for, on this for six months. It's now part of their routine surveillance pipelines. It's used for decision-making and resource allocation alongside a bunch of other tools. Uh, you'll have the links in there. There's actually another shiny app which is publicly available. So you can actually see this in, in production being used on the WHO uh, shiny app. Okay, I'm sorry for being over time. Um, just to say that if you're a, a young data scientist or an aspiring data scientist, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities in outbreak analytics. And uh, Bill Gates blogged about, about us as like the Avengers of virus hunters. And I, I think this is very, very far from the truth. Now that's this article there. Um, but there's actually nonetheless exciting things to be done, whether it's methodological development, or if you're interested in programming and software development, or just if you like doing training and, uh, and capacity building. Tons of opportunities there. And with this, I'll just leave you with an advertising for a big project that's coming out early next year. We'll start recruiting four outbreak analytics programmers uh, at the London School joint with like other uh, partner centers. And I think with this, um, I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. So thank you. Um, I guess first um, for people online, if you have questions, please post them. Uh, and maybe I'll start off with one question. Um, that I kind of thought of as you were going through. So you talked about analytical cells that were deployed, or at least one cell that was deployed for Ebola. Could you do two things? First, talk about the cell, like who was part of that team? Because I think using the word cell for like a team, who was part of the team and what the skills were? A little bit on like day to day, like what was actually going on. And then the second part of the question was, is, um, is there anything analogous that is, was created for COVID? Oh, uh, great question. Okay, so um, so the the team. So I joined the team probably five to six months after it got created, uh, but there was no infrastructure at the time. So but, but my role was to build it, to build in the data infrastructure. Um, it, one of the key things for the team was actually its composition that was super diverse. So we had field epidemiologists, we had um, 
some statisticians increasingly, in fact, I started recruiting statisticians and data scientists after being there. Um, we had some GIS, one GIS expert. And uh, one of the key things was also to have social scientists. Uh, in fact, a now very good friend of mine was like leading the social sciences for UNICEF at the time. Well, still is. And um, that was key because typically the ideal way that kind of cell would work, I think, is the data scientist will flag something unusual. So we survey a lot of data. We had a lot of, of basically routine surveillance to do and some ad hoc analysis to do as well. And so it, it may be the case that we would see something and we could show statistically that it wasn't in line with normal expectations. Um, and But then that doesn't tell you why it's different. Okay, so I'll, I'll take an example. Um, one of the key things we were doing was looking at the quality of the response, so to speak, in real time. There are different indicators that you can track to make sure that uh, you're, for instance, not missing cases. And one of the things we realized was we were actually, in one location specifically, we were missing a lot of the cases. In fact, 95% of the people who matched the APKS definition and should have been tested for Ebola, that is, we weren't sure, but we suspected they might have Ebola and they need testing. 95% of the people who were tested, uh, who should have been tested, sorry, were not. So out of 100 people that could have had Ebola that we should have tested, only five were tested. Now we flagged this, um, we don't know why. Maybe it's artifactual, maybe it's data quality, maybe it's something else. And this is where the field epidemiologists are gonna be very important, but also the social scientists, because these are the people who can actually investigate on the ground, ask questions in a rigorous way to look at Ebola perception, um, response perception and see what makes this, what the origin of this problem is. In this case, uh, it was a mixed bag, but mostly untrained staff on the ground. So they were actually missing these cases. Um, and it was revealed that they didn't know what the Ebola definition, case definition was or were not applying it well. Uh, they were retrained and then that problem was fixed. And we actually saw the improvement right after. So in terms of how we worked, that was the, 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 some of it was uh, this kind of like routine surveillance stuff. And some of it would be literally the, the head of the response. So uh, that was Michel Yao at the time at the WHO, who was like the incident manager that is the leader of the response, who could come a morning and say, well, we need to know the Mambasa Center, the, the one I, I just showed in my talk, uh, got destroyed. We need to rebuild it. Uh, how big do we need to rebuild it? Uh, is that going to be sufficient? And can you say something with modeling? Uh, so it was a bit of a mixed bag of proactive things and, and just answering questions. I don't know if I if I answered your question well. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so another question, this one's uh, from Doreen. So uh, if I remember correctly, Ebola is spread by blood and bodily fluids. COVID is respiratory. How much of the work that we talked about today and in general um, is applicable across both or is it fairly different? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, it is a bit different. Um, the anything that's airborne is 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 bad um, because you know it transmits just so much more easily. So in the case when you have a disease like Ebola, which is exactly what what said, bodily fluids, uh, it's going to be very very close contacts that will you know person to person transmission. The other thing is there's no asymptomatic cases or very, very few. You know, it's a very, very virulent disease. Um, and so in terms of control, it's gonna, going to change the game a little bit. Yes, it's very, very deadly. But if you miss cases, that's because you haven't surveyed these people. It's not because there is an asymptomatic carrier that can infect a dozen people without, um, without you knowing, with, without them knowing. Uh, so in terms of intervention, it's going to be very different. For instance, a, a lot of the Ebola intervention revolves around contact tracing. That is, you you try to to reconstruct who infected whom and who a given case could have, who could they have infected. Uh, and it's quite, it's it's a lot of work. It's very hard work, but it's doable because you can, you know, the, the symptoms are very clear. You know, it's going to be vomiting, it's going to be diarrhea, it's going to be bleeding, unexplained bleeding. Uh, so you can ask a patient, okay, do, have you been in contact with somebody who had these symptoms over the last, you know, 
couple of days, weeks, uh, and usually they'll they'll be able to tell you. It, in the case of COVID, you can you know contact tracing is tremendously harder, uh, and yeah, so yes, it does. The mode of transmission changes the dynamics. Uh, and it's not just the mode of transmission. The length of the incubation period changes a lot as well. And the overall in infectiousness of, of individuals. I mean, the f famous reproduction number also changes things quite a bit. Thanks. Uh, another question came in through private message. Uh, you seem to have knowledge both uh, technical and medical as well as data. So I guess you can think of three different areas. Um, can you talk about, um, can people enter this field without a lot of medical knowledge to do health analytics? I think is the focus of the question. So can you do health oh, analytics yes. without, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, first thing, uh, disclaimer, no, I don't. Sorry, light is in my face right now. Uh, no, I, I don't really have any medical knowledge. Uh, I kind of like picked it up. My background was biology and ecology. Um, and uh, then I got into biostats kind of by accident. Uh, so yes, you can whatever skills you have for data analysis, uh, you can be useful in this field. It could be just software programming. It could be that you are a pro at making interactive graphics that are very informative, or you're into you know, very computationally intensive approaches. Uh, there's such a need for skills at the moment, and nobody's got all the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, you know, field epidemiologists are getting into data analysis, but it's not their trade. Statisticians and, and mathematical modelers don't really go to the field uh, and don't necessarily have an awareness of how the response is on the ground. Um, you know, yeah, we need, we need a lot of different profiles and uh, nobody's got all the pieces of the puzzle. That's good to hear. Maybe some of my students will participate. Uh, another question is, um, how do you set up objectives for each of your models and how do you measure model performance? That is a great question. It really depends what we do. Um, on, on, this, on the example of the, um, the Ebola outbreak in North Kivu, you make predictions of, uh, one of the key things we were doing was like saying, this is how many cases we expect to see in three weeks time. Not further than that, because then it's just science fiction and nobody can predict that. But uh, we'd say, well, it's, we expect on average 10 to 20 cases a day. And then people would go like, no, there is no way. And then it happens. And, and so that's your measure of validation. You basically see what you, whether or not what you predicted was right. Um, and there's tons of ways to evaluate forecasting models uh, using simulations and any kind of methodology, really. Uh, so sometimes you just simulate outbreaks that you know everything about, and then you see if your method is able to, to reconstruct things. Uh, but the problem is the reason, very often the reason why a model is gonna be wrong is not necessarily the methodology in itself, could be, but quite often it's just reality is more complicated. And so, you know, something changed in the response and now we are not picking up cases in this place because uh, the response is not happening because of security reasons. Well, you see cases going down there artificially, You're, no way your model will have, would have predicted that. It's just the way reality works, it's complicated. Another question, um, what do you think the most important skills are from a data scientist perspective that wants to kind of, I guess this is from a, probably an aspiring data scientist, so what skills would you encourage them to kind of uh, focus on achieving to contribute in the field? I'd say R programming, but I'm very biased. Uh, I mean, I, I created a consortium which is called the R Epidemic Consortium for a reason. So I'm, I'm definitely doing propaganda here. Uh, the reason why we're using R is in terms of collection of packages for data analysis, it's probably the most complete that we have currently, especially for, for epidemics. Um, I'd say that first, because if you code decently and cleanly in, in a way that's readable by other people, it's kind of like the, the technical limitation, if you want. So if you struggle with this, then making nice visualization, visualizations is going to be tricky. Uh, creating new ways to, to new statistical tests or any new thing you want to do is going to be a bit of a struggle because there's going to be that technical layer that's going to get in the way pretty much all the time. Uh, so I, I would say... Like get this out of the way, be good at, at coding in a way that's reusable by other people, that's clear, that's simple to read. That's probably the most important thing uh, because that's like the prior to like everything that follows. 
Great. Um, uh, so you mentioned number of beds as being kind of a key parameter that you were kind of looking at. Could you um, talk about uh, some other important um, attributes or parameters while you're kind of doing analysis? Sorry, I, di I didn't get the beginning of the question. Can you? Uh, so can you, you mentioned um, the number of beds was uh, part of your model. I think you were talking about um, when you were going to rebuild, uh, I think, one of the Ebola places. Um, so I think the question focuses on uh, what other, were there other key parameters that you were trying to predict? Um, so number of beds, but other other things like uh, you know medical supplies or whatever the case might be. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, tons. I, I couldn't list everything. And sometimes it's not just prediction; it's assessing what's happening now. Like like the the example of like alerts, uh, like testing being insufficient, uh, but also just checking that, for instance, people who get tested, there is no you know systematic bias based on gender which could happen, which could reflect a uh, differential access to healthcare, which would be, you know, something we really want to avoid, uh, or, or age patterns, or sometimes it's going to be just about describing what's happening. And sometimes it's about prediction. So, but like, yeah, it, you know, a uh, role in transmission, who's, who is the creating the most secondary infections in the case of Ebola in this outbreak was a lot of community death and funeral exposure. That is, people washing the body of of the dead and getting contaminated that way, and you could you could have just a burst of transmission. So that was one of the big things we were trying to assess: uh, the, the growth rate, how fast is it growing, uh, mortality is the mortality rate the same across all our treatment centers? Do we have treatment centers that are worse off than others? Uh, trying to assess spatial spread what fraction of the infection in a given place comes from somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, it, it's very, very context dependent. It's not going to be the same for, for two different outbreaks. Okay, another question came in. I'm going to focus a little bit on this. Um, so were there a lot of attributes that you had to encode or transform? So I think the question is really about feature engineering as you're doing machine learning. Um, so I think they're curious a little bit about, did you have to do any feature engineering uh, was that feature engineering consistent across the different models you were using and things like that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny because it, it's not the terminology I'm, I'm super familiar with. I'm more of an old school statistician. Um, feature engineering, yes and no. Uh, very little in, in the way of uh, ordination in, in reduced space, you know, so, you know, so principal component analysis and that kind of stuff we didn't really have to do. Uh, most of the what would fall under feature engineering? Maybe a lot of data cleaning. Uh, data cleaning is 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 can be immensely complex. Uh, in fact, I have some colleagues who actually have you know uh, Bayesian methods trying to fill the gaps in in a data set when you know you see you see things are just not not realistic, like people dying first and then showing symptoms, uh, and so. A, a lot of the da data pre-processing, if you want, before modeling, was was down to cleaning. A uh, related question is about um, collecting and cleaning data that's um, being collected by others. So I think there's a question here kind of implicitly that you're modeling not just on data that you as a data science team have, but you're collecting from the field or other areas. So um, can you talk a little bit about that collection process and the challenges of that collection process? Yeah, I won't talk about the collection process because, as you say, I don't collect data myself. And it's it's not just the data that somebody else is collecting. It's their work. And that's important to acknowledge because that means one of the things we did, I think, poorly, uh, it was having people who were on the ground collecting the data for a given thing on board from the get going when we were analyzing the data. And because they they've got the awareness of context. So one of the good thing that we had being still close to the field were at the emergency operations center, that is the coordination in country in, in the middle of North Kivu. Uh, but it, you, you've got many different field stations. That's where the transmission is happening. And you definitely need to collaborate closely with these people. And I think that's probably true of like most data science. You need to, you need this awareness of the context and the limitations of the data. Uh, and you need that close collaboration with, with the people gathering the data. Uh, if you want to make sure you understand what's going on. Thanks. Uh, somebody wants to go back to the discussion of programming in R. And um, basically, uh, I think the question is, is pretty much most of the analytics and modeling done in R, or is Python also an important language 
from a technical perspective as you're doing kind of outbreak analytics? Uh, for outbreak analytics, Python for now is, is not really a thing. Um, but if you do bioinformatics, Python is going to be the thing. You know, uh, if, if you if you process data that the sequences spit out and you want to assemble genomes and that's, you know, Python is going to be all the way. Uh, so in, I don't think the language features themselves justify that. It's just what tool are around and what uh, what community what what the community is using as well. Uh, so it, it could be Python, Julia, R, whatever. Uh, but it, it so happens that most of the tools we need currently are in R. Yeah, I think that's um, that's good to hear. I kind of tell our students that they need to learn both because depending what context, um, you're going to have to use one or the other and you might not get to choose. I think we're kind of running out of time. We have one more. Um, let's see. Oh, um, so I'm going to read this one directly here. So how, how does working on solving an epidemic impact timelines? Assuming you need to validate models. So how does that work? Um, and does that change, obviously, when lives are at stake? So a lot of data scientists are working on things that lives are not at stake. But how do you validate when you know, it, you know every day that you validate you know, is costing lives? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very hard question, especially if <laughs> we're pressed with time. But it's a great one. Uh, it's, you, you kind of need everything for yesterday or the day before. So techni technically what happens is teams work long hours, uh, often at night to make sure that we finish things in time because there's this drive that for once you believe you're doing something that's marginally useful. Um, and validation is a, is a real problem. So, especially when you do research, uh, because I'm a, my job mostly is to develop new new statistical methods. And if you develop a new statistical method, you don't really have time to test it really well. Certainly, you don't have it the time to publish it in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, and and so that's very complicated. We don't really have the answer for now. We we basically try to emulate the process of peer review with colleagues that we could pressure for time and that could basically you know look at, look at things overnight and and give us some feedback on the next day. Uh, but it's a real problem. It's been the same for COVID, I must say. It, you know, like much larger teams of academic researchers and still the problem of validation is, is a, a huge one. Yeah. Yeah, um, and maybe we'll uh, end on one question that tries to summarize a bunch of what you said, which is uh, you've, we've talked about lots of different challenges, lots of different things you're working on. If you could think about, you know, going over the next year or two, what's, what's like the top problem that you are, you know, hopeful the field will work on and try to solve? That's kind of kind of like the thing I was pointing at, at my in my last slide. I've been trying to develop R packages for our back analytics for nearly 10 years. Um, what you got typically was a little pat on the back from the founders uh, saying, oh, that's great. It's super important. Somebody does it but you don't get funding for it. You don't get recognition for it. it. It's not, you know, an academically rewarded thing. You need papers and grants in academia, um, which is where I work. Uh, and, uh, and so we, like, I've seen since 2009, the flu pandemic, the tools we need for data analysis are we missing, with the, the tools we're missing then, many of them we are still missing nowadays. And um, so we finally got funding for this. And so I think that's going to be the, the top priority now. It's like uh, stop reinventing the wheel every time there's an outbreak because there is always going to be outbreaks. Uh, and we need to have a solid toolkit to, to do the analysis uh, and not just recode everything from scratch every time there is a, there is a, a new outbreak somewhere.